Hi everyone, welcome out to the Dice Tower. My name is Chris Yee. I'm Mike Delicio. I'm Wendy Yee. Today we're taking a look at this game here called Sleeping Gods Primeval Peril. This is Sleeping Gods, but smaller. Mini. Mm, much roughly, smaller. Roughly the size of one Detroit style pizza. Or a boat, mm. as it shows on the side. So this was part of the original Sleeping Gods Kickstarter as a print and play. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Ryan Locke, designer, artist, music photographer, mm. cinematographer, stop me before I get too uh, yeah, right no. on here, mm -hmm. rounded it out basically and then made it a, an available separate item that you can purchase and play through. Um, and it's like a smaller Sleeping Gods, basically. Yeah, this was actually part, this version was part of the Distant Skies Kickstarter, which is like mm -hmm. the follow-up to Sleeping Gods, yeah. Yep, so in two and a half years' time, he made three of these because <laughs> Ryan Lockett does not sleep. So Certainly I'll show not. you what's different about this one, how this one plays, and then we'll give you our thoughts. All right, here we see Sleeping Gods Primeval Peril set up. First thing I want to state is that this is going to be the most basic of overviews. This is not anywhere near a learn to play. I am leaving a lot of things out on purpose because this is a game where exploration and discovery is a huge, huge part of it. If you've played Sleeping Gods, much of this might look familiar to you, and that is by design. It's a smaller condensed version of that game. At the beginning, you're gonna have your four characters here that are going to be distributed as equally as possible amongst the players. And then you have the captain, which is a shared uh, character that whoever the active player happens to be would also have access to their abilities and such. Uh, at the beginning of the game, you're gonna start off with a journey log here that's gonna lay out the entire uh, map of the Atlas here, which are gonna be a series of pages that you can uh, travel on and explore. And you're gonna have tracking of your blood flowers, which are gonna help your characters level up, things along those lines. If you wanted to kind of see how one looked, this was one of my earlier ones that I had played with. All right, so each turn, the active player is gonna go through a three-step process. First, they're going to draw an event card and resolve that. Then they're going to take actions. And then finally, you're going to have an end of turn. All right. So the first thing is to draw an event. Let's say that Dr. Timothy Milk here was the active player. They would draw the top card off of the event deck and resolve it. This is giant mosquitoes. Not great. Dr. Milk, who happens to be the active player, is covered in painful itchy bites. So he's going to gain a venom status effect and also some meat. And so you would just take that associated token, which is not a good one, minus one health at turn start, and the meat could go in his storage here or it could go into the storage on the ship. All right, the next thing you're gonna do is the meat of the game, which is taking actions. And there are four main actions that you can take here. I'll talk about them all briefly. All of them except for rest are gonna cost a particular amount of time. You start off here and you've got these five time that you can spend. If you stop on the fourth spot, you can leave an extra time for the next active player. But generally speaking, you'll use all that time that you have. Traveling is very simple. You can move along the map, crossing these dotted lines, and spend one time for each space that you cross. So let's say that the boat wanted to go here and here. It would move two because each one is one. If you ever leave the maps, you're gonna uh, flip to the page that it tells you to and come in on the opposite side. So in this case, if they traveled off the map here, they'd flip it to page four and enter from the bottom. Similar situation over there. Explore is the next action, and that's gonna be dealing with these numbered circles or the squares, okay? If you are going to do the square, it's gonna tell you how it works here. You have to pay a treasure map, you would cross that location off, and then you would do a check. All right, checks uh, are going to be certain icons. This one happens to be a perception, a perception. You can use your perception skill. Other players can lend you their perception skills by spending one of their prestige tokens. And you try to do a check, rolling a die, adding to all that. And there are fail and success uh, effects that happen according to which happens, okay? Um, if you explore on the circles that have the numbers on them, then what you're gonna do is you're gonna turn to, it's actually the rule book and the story book, and I'm not gonna show you too much of these, but you would flip to the associated one, do 
what it says. Usually it's going to involve checks, things along those lines. I'm going to skip repair for a moment and I'm going to go to, or excuse me, I'm going to skip rest for a moment and go to repair. Repair is dealing with your ship. Your boat here starts with six health, but it can get damaged on a number of different things, effects that happen, events that happen, uh, obstacles on the map. They can also, you know, they can knock down your boat. And if you want to repair it, you spend two time and then you're going to be doing a craft check. All right. If you get a craft, a, a craft result of one to five, you repair at one, six to seven would be two and eight plus would be three. Finally, we have rest here, and this does not cost any time, but what you have to do is cross off one of the moons here at the, oh, here you go, at the bottom of your journey log, and that's going to be kind of a reset. Uh, each player is going to get all their prestige tokens back. They're going to gain two health. You can remove one status amongst the crew, and additionally, you can spend a, uh, these two resources to get five health that can then be distributed amongst the crew. All right, that's the basic idea. You are trying to complete a mission. I won't go into too many details, but basically you're trying to rescue a kidnapped passenger. There will be combat that can take place and very likely will take place. Um, and each page is gonna have an associated combat. You don't know what here is gonna potentially trigger that unless you've already played through it, but this one would be on this page, you would be facing off against three Zakmir Crocs, and there is a process that is involved in doing that combat that is mostly revolving around these combat cards that the players are going to draw. Each player would, play a, would draw a combat card, and it could be something that would help them to defeat these Crocs. So for example, someone may be playing a machete. They're going to do two damage plus whatever they roll on this combat die. So in this case, not a great roll. They'd be doing three damage. The damage would be associated, you'd be targeting one of the particular Crocs in this case, or enemies, depending on where they are. And depending on the number of uh, damage, you're going to be placing the damage markers on top of these, okay? There's more details to this, more nuance to this, but you're gonna to continue to do that until you get to the end of the round. Any end of round effects that they're gonna do uh, will trigger. They also are going to be doing some uh, counter attacks to you that you have to track on your health board. You're going to continue to play through this until a loss effect occurs or you are ultimately successful. But again, I don't want to go into a lot of detail there, but this is the basic flow of the game. Let's head back and let you know what we think. So one of the first things on the box, it says, this is for one to two players, mm -hmm. uh, which the original Sleeping Gods was uh, had a higher player count than that. Mm -hmm. And then in the back of the rule book, it says, you can also just play this with three and four people if you right. want. It's interesting right. because there's multiple characters, and I remember feeling that way about Sleeping Gods too, that I was like, there's a lot of characters because you're controlling two or three at a time. Mm -hmm. And so you're like, this could be split up or you could just control a bunch. It's not confusing to have multiple characters in front of you. Right, so uh, this is... I mean, I think that this is going to be. You can. You should speak to this. Okay. Is this a more soloable Sleeping Gods to you? This is very much a more soloable Sleeping Gods because there's much less uh, administration you have to do as the solo player. You have four characters, um, one of them being the captain, right? Uh, much more manageable. I have not played it two player, you have not played it solo. Mm -hmm. My thought is that this is really a solo game, but I'll be interested to hear your perspective on that. Because in this game, every resource is shared, essentially, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when we play the two player, I'm doing a challenge, but we're literally all in the same boat. Yes. So I'm like, oh no, I need rope for this challenge. Can you I, hand me some I rope? I got rope mm -hmm. in my backpack. <laughs> right, right. Here, yeah. But at the same time, it doesn't feel like... I mean, it functionally is a glorified solo. Yes. There's, when did I split up half the characters? Yeah, things like in combat, it matters because I take a turn, then Chris takes right, a turn. Right, right. You know what I mean? So your, your characters are split up, and you have that shared captain. Mm -hmm. So I feel like it's a great cooperative game. Like, Good. It mm -hmm. would... I don't know. My side of things is I feel like looking at it, I think I don't want to control... Five characters or whatever it is? Sure. Four characters, five characters? Four characters, Four yeah. plus captain. I Four plus captain would be so five, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. 
I don't think I want to control that many characters. But at the same time, each individual character doesn't have a lot of administrative, except no. for when you take those breaks and you reset. Then you have to remember what everybody does. But mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I can see it being either way, just fine. Yeah, I enjoyed it just fine at two. I never thought, why is why is Wendy even here? As I often think to myself. <laughs> right, yeah. No, it's it's nice, I'm sure, to have the uh, the brain power, too, to kind of think about, especially in combat. That's where you're making many of your decisions, so to speak. You know mm. what I mean? Uh, otherwise, you're choosing options. You know what I mean? When right. you face a challenge or things along those lines. The yeah. stuff like taking each individual action where you're like, I move the boat one space, mm -hmm. you move the boat one space, like right. that. I agree that that feels more like a solo game mm -hmm. style thing. Yeah. But we're good at cooperating, so we kind of decide where we're going, and then whoever's action it happens to be, it just happens to be their action. Right. Yeah. So this has all the same general concepts from Sleeping Gods. There's a big map to explore. Yep. The, uh, it is in a map book, which mm -hmm. I love. Love the map book. Mm -hmm. right. Oh, I, I, we're exploring north of here. It says go to page 14. Cool. And just make sure you enter from the bottom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Fantastic. That's it great. doesn't have 90 tiles and 100 <laughs> yeah, extra resources. It's yes. all just print in the book. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Gives you a sense of exploration, gives you a sense of adventure, gives mm -hmm. you a sense of story. Yes. I think it does all of those things very well. Mm -hmm. And I would expect as much because, <laughs> you know, the original game is very well received. Yes, we've all played that one as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you much more than than we have. Okay, uh, but yeah, we've played like part of a of a scenario. Oh, the I've original played, Sleeping I've Gods. played mul yeah multiple campaigns yeah. of Sleeping Gods. Yeah, yeah, we haven't finished an entire campaign of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I thought, oh, do we want to get it? But when I heard that this was coming out, I thought, well, this sounds like something that one day I would more likely the two of us sit down and play. Yes, yeah, and finish and actually finish. Right, yeah. right, right, right. That's yeah. a that's a big difference. Um, so a couple of differences uh, between, because a lot of people are going to ask, is this basically just mini sleeping gods? And, yeah. and in, in many cases it is, because mm -hmm. actually, like you said, it was part of the first Sleeping Gods campaign as a print and play. This has been much, you know, I played that print and play. This is more, right? Is this is meteor? just more, more meatier, robust, more right. robust. Um, but um, one of the differences is in combat, right? The way that combat is, uh, this is going to, this is basically using the combat system that will be in distant skies. Yeah. And so that's a nice, that's why this can be a nice bridge between the two is that it gives you an idea and it almost, I would imagine, I haven't played distant skies, but my guess is that this is going to be a nice primer for that. That's fair. Right? It's okay. going to be like, okay. Here's how some of these things changed. Here's the combat system, so you can be familiar with that. Because honestly, one of the negatives of Sleeping Gods, and there were not many, I believe I gave it a nine, uh, was that I felt that the combat system was a little bit more convoluted and complex than it needed to be. I do feel that the combat system is similar, but better in this. What change in the combat system? Because I don't have, I mean, that was so many years ago. Yeah. Do you, do you remember I mean, some it's, of the details? Again, it has a lot of the same ideas of your your doing damage, placing hearts, uh, have to place them, you know, kind of in, in orthogonal directions. You mm -hmm. can have splash damage, that type of a thing. Um, but I'm trying to remember what the specific difference is. With this one, you have that shared weapons deck. Right, it's the weapons you, deck. Thank you. Oh, yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. You deal them out a little bit to each player, right. and then they choose a weapon to work with. Thank you. Yes, yeah, yeah. And I think that's better. I did like the weapons. Mm -hmm. It's it was fun. It was mm -hmm. fun that you could also build up that we weapons deck throughout. Right. Like you don't start with nothing, but you right. start without some basic stuff. Yes. And you get to choose what you pull out, what you add in. Right, right. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's a much better system. Uh, yeah. And it makes me even more excited about Distant Skies, to be honest with you. I, I agree. do. I do know when we first started playing this, I was afraid of combat. Mm -hmm. I was worried that we would just get wrecked. And so I wasn't fighting things, but then I realized. Oh, if, as soon as we like accidentally ended up in something right. and we beat it, I was like, oh, this helps me progress to the end game. And so it made sense. Another, I think, big difference with this, and I don't know if it's going to be the same way in, in Distant Skies, is that you know what you're going to be fighting if you fight on that map. Those enemies are on the other page. Right. 
right? Yeah. So you know, if I get into a combat in this map, that's what I'm fighting. That's their difficulty. Yeah. Um, and you also have a pretty good idea of where that combat may take place, right? There's those couple of places that you're usually going to be like, okay, this vine area over here, this tree vine area, that this, uh, you know, this is probably going to be where I fight. It's a sketchy yeah. neighborhood of the jungle. Right, exactly. You can get a pretty good idea. and you Walk don't, the boat doors. Right. You don't have to do those. Mm -hmm. You're incentivized to. But you don't you don't have to. I think that's another big difference. And again, I don't know if Distance Skies is going to go that route or not. Um, but I, I think that's a, a a thing that makes combat slightly less terrifying mm. because you know I'm not facing off against a level nine kraken. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> I'm not so, ready for that yet. Or I am, you know, and am I ready for that? Yeah. So, there you but go. I could also see if somebody wanted that unknown, if they wanted it to be a big surprise, mm -hmm. you turn to the page and you just don't flip the next page. You could do that. So you don't there. know. Right. Yeah, so if you just don't know if there's going to be something mm -hmm. to fight or not, or if it's just another map page. Right, yeah. The one other, I think, very noticeable difference is going to be that the river path that you move in this game is more defined. A hundred percent. It yeah. is smaller in scope. It is yes. not yeah. the massive open world, which I know, um, I don't want to speak for Tom, I will. <laughs> that would disappoint him. Yes. Because that's the allure of the original Sleeping Gods. Mm -hmm. You start in the middle of the map, go a direction. Mm -hmm. 16 hours later, you've not touched most of the map. Correct. And you take the knowledge you've learned from one fin finished campaign, Yes. and you can take that knowledge to the next one. Mm -hmm. This one's much smaller. The campaign is not 16 hours, for example. I no. think it's, would you say five? Five even on the long end, maybe. Okay. I think yeah. this also makes it so that you can you can chase the things you know you can do. Mm -hmm. There are some of those, um, there's little symbols on the map in front of you that you're crossing stuff yeah. on. So you know where you're going and there's symbols and you you slowly begin to figure out, you're like, okay, I need rope to do this type of thing. Right. I need fire to do this type of thing. So if you just don't have fire, you're not going to go in the directions that take you to those particular icons. Mm -hmm. And so if you're looking for like, hey, I need one or two more blood flowers, where can I find them? You just look at your map and you can figure it out. You can usually figure it out. Yeah. I, I guess I'm going to expand a little bit on, I don't know if we're ready to go to final thoughts, uh, but if we are, I can I can kind of use that thing you started with uh, of sure, being it. smaller in scope, okay? Um, it is much smaller in scope in just about every way than Sleeping Gods, and I'm sure than Distant Skies, which I imagine is even going to be bigger than Sleeping Gods was in right. terms of scope and, and everything. That has positives and negatives, okay? So Absolutely. let's talk about what I think the positives are. The positives are is that this is much easier to get to the table. Like, orders of magnitude easier, right? Yeah. Setup's easier, teardown's easier, playing is easier. You can reasonably play through a full campaign in an, in an afternoon or an evening if that's what you want to do. Um, so that's a positive. I think it's less intimidating to new players uh, because the scope is so much smaller, right? So those are positives. The negatives are that it has the name Sleeping Gods on it, which really means that you are in that mindset, potentially, of this is a game of, like Sleeping Gods. And in many ways it is, but what you mentioned earlier is that it does not have any of that wide open go wherever you want, do whatever you want to do. You can play through it many, many, many times. And I still don't think you're going to see everything in Sleeping Gods unless you just play it Dozens and dozens and dozens of full campaigns, right? Methodically. Yes, exactly. And yeah. going out of your way to do things that are different, mm -hmm. which you can easily do in that game. Yeah. This is not that case. Yeah. Once you've played through a single campaign all the way through, you know most of what you need to know, right? There's not going to be a lot of discovery. I don't think this game, to be fair, was designed to be as um, replayable as Sleeping Gods. It just. I agree can't be, right? I think that if you know going in that this is a game that maybe has maybe three complete playthroughs, maybe. You might see and read every encounter. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly yeah. right. So you need to know that going in. This is much smaller in scope. But it also is hard if you've played Sleeping Gods to not compare it to that. Mm -hmm. And it, it definitely... It just feels like a much smaller package. Now, it's much more expansive than the print and play was, and I appreciate that it exists, 
but it, it, it's hard. It's hard to remove it from where it came from. So it is still a game that I like a lot. I like the changes that make me even more excited about Distance Skies. The combat is significantly better. Um, and, and so I'm giving it an eight, right? It, it, I'm trying to review it as it's in and of itself, but it's, I can't do it. The bottom line is maybe I'm not a good enough reviewer to remove this from my experiences playing Sleeping Gods. It's just, it doesn't have that same scope, but again, it wasn't trying to. So I'm giving it an eight. Easily recommend it. If you're a fan of Sleeping Gods, I think absolutely play this. Um, if you're not, if you were intrigued by Sleeping Gods, but intimidated by it or didn't want to spend the cost, give this a shot. If you're a solo player, 100% give it a shot. There you go. I'm giving this one an 8.5 because I... How do I say this? Sleeping Gods is Gloomhaven. This is kind of a Jaws I of the I almost went that route. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Jaws of the Leopard. It's a mm. little bit more small scale than that, right? right. It, it's the easiest analogy we have as gamers. I'm sorry if that reference doesn't quite make sense. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but this is such a playable product. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's one that I... Am excited to go through, even though we finished a campaign and and uh, we've seen most of the map that first time that we played through. It's still fun because they give you not to tease too much, mm -hmm. but they give you a little thing at the end of the book that says, "Finish with your whole first play through." Here's a little setup difference mm -hmm. for your next play, right. and it gives you about four or five of those. So I could see in a little while coming back, hey. Let's pull this one out again mm -hmm. because the management, the upkeep, the setup, all of those things is so greatly reduced. Yeah. I think those sacrifices are worth it if you are looking for that. Right, that's it. That's it. And, and so that's the thing. If you're looking for even more of Sleeping Gods, exactly as was, it's not that. Right. Um, but but you're, I, I love your point that it's not trying to be that. This right. is a great entry point. And... If you are intimidated by Sleeping Gods, because not every, not everyone is looking for a game sure. that has a hundred thirty hours of content <laughs> in it. If you're looking for something with ten to fifteen, mm -hmm. then this is wonderful. Yeah, we don't play through campaigns all that often. We don't. We don't. And we seldom replay through campaigns. So this is one I could actually see doing that with. So it's an eight point five. I think it's great. The writing, the art. The, yeah, we didn't even mention the production and the art. It's always great with, with Red Raven. It just yeah. is. Yeah, and uh, sorry if that sounds like it's a given, but it almost is at this point. So, yeah, <laughs> so many wonderful things. Okay, so it has a two-hour marker on the box, mm -hmm. right? Did you Were you able to play a solo game in two hours, no. like the full campaign? No. What is that two hours supposed to mean? Because we definitely didn't. We played the campaign across a couple nights. Across two nights, two, two, two three and a half hours, hours each. each. Yeah. I think my... <laughs> My second playthrough was definitely quicker than my first mm -hmm. one. I still don't think it got near two hours. I think yeah. I was still getting very close to four hours on my on my second playthrough. You're a liar, Ryan Lockett. <laughs> you lie. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe maybe you could if you've played through it a number of times. You know, maybe you could. Um, that, that seems like, a oh, little. Yeah. I know what this is. Right. Answer C. <laughs> no, you want to read. You want to. Yeah, I don't want to. This is yeah. not a game I want to rush through. That's another point. Yeah. Is that, yeah. I, I think that's a little ambitious on the. So on that. The time. I mean, I think that's the thing. Is I went into this thinking this is way smaller than Sleeping Gods. I'm going to play it all in one night. Mm -hmm. So I went into this with kind of the wrong expectation mm. initially, um, and I had to switch that mindset up and realize this is a different game than I was thinking because yeah. I was thinking. At first, I was thinking Sleeping Gods, which is <laughs> hours and hours and hours. And then then it kind of was like, oh, no, this is two hours digestible. So it's somewhere in between. Um, I'm going to give this a 7.5, which apparently means I hate it, which is not true. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. Um, it was longer than expected, like I said. So there was a little bit of that, like, refiguring out my expectations. Um, but... This is one of those games that was lin more linear than I expected mm -hmm. with the river. So there's just a couple of those things that made it so it wasn't in, you know, the, the eight or eight and a half. But overall, I very much enjoyed it. I like that storyline. I like that you, as you make decisions, it unlocks these key words mm -hmm. and those can come up later in the game and they can be important or they could not matter or they could be extremely valuable. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It just depends. Um, I also like that as you're going through that river, you have... You have some idea of what you can do because of the symbols on the map, 
but then you also want to explore. And mm -hmm. so you're like, I could go to another place that doesn't have a symbol. And in those moments, you're like, I don't know what it's going to be. It could be combat. Yep. It could be just a little bit of a story and you don't really get much of mm -hmm. anything. Or it could be this awesome thing where you're getting the blood flowers and it's going to help you complete the game. And so I like that choice of do I want to play it safe? Do I want to play not safe? And mm -hmm. so there's there's a lot that's really good going on in this. Once again, have that expectation of the right amount of time. It might take a couple evenings, might take a few hour, extra hours. Um, but yeah, I think a 7.5 for Sleeping Gods because it's quite good. So we're all recommending it, definitely. And mm -hmm. I think that, uh, Mike, you, I really want to reiterate what you said. Go into it with the right expectation right. of what it is as a yeah. product. Uh, but that's why I'm giving an 8.5. So highest of 8.5, meaning it's getting a seal of excellence. Mm -hmm. I think and I don't wonderful. argue with that. I'm, I'm, you know, an 8 is... <laughs> The difference between 8 and 8.5 is pretty... And a 7.5 is also a very good We're all in very similar, good we have similar yeah. thoughts. All recommending yeah. it. So there you go. That's the, the smaller, the more digestible Sleeping Gods Primeval Peril. My name is Chris Yee. I'm Mike Delicio. And I'm Wendy Yee. Stay exploring. Hmm.